Hello, everybody. Welcome tonight to this Facebook Live Bible study that we're going to be having tonight. I'm so excited about the material that we're going to be looking at over the next uh, few weeks. And uh, anyway, we want to welcome you. Hope everything is well with you and your family. Uh, we are certainly praying and continuing to pray about you know, all of the situation in our country, in our land. We're just asking God to heal this great rift, that God would bring, uh, you know, an end of, of violence, uh, God, and, and that God would bring a peace to our land and uh, an end to racism and all of these things that have been happening in our, in our country. But anyway, we're glad that you're joining us tonight. I know that it, we're going to just hold off just, just for about a minute or two, just as people are joining us here before we jump into the Word of God. But let's just begin with the Word of Prayer for our nation tonight. I think that would be awesome, all right? So, Lord, we come to you today. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your great power. We thank you that you are always available in every moment to be called upon. And, Lord, we as a church uh, need to call upon you at this time for our nation Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that you're doing things, Lord, in people's hearts and lives during these days. But, Lord, we ask, God, that you would somehow, Lord, give a wisdom to our governors, our president, our mayors, our police chiefs. And, Lord, we pray that there would come an end, Lord, to the violence that's being taken uh, to our city streets. And, Lord, we also pray, Lord, that that uh, that there would be an end to police brutality and racism and for justice to be served in our country. We believe you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope today that you have your Bible, right? I've got mine, and uh, I hope you're ready to study the Word of God with us tonight as we jump into a brand new series of teachings that I'm going to be doing out of the book of Philippians, all right? And so I want you to, as you join us every Wednesday here, I want you to have a Bible and a paper and a pen, and uh, we're going to begin teaching uh, out of the book of Philippians, as I said a moment ago, and I really love this little epistle that Paul wrote. I have studied it. I've read it numerous times. I've preached out of it hundreds of times, probably. I don't know, but it's a book about joy and rejoicing. Uh, uh, the church that Paul was writing to was started when actually when Paul had a vision, a supernatural vision from God. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 16. And in that uh, vision, he saw a man pleading with him, saying, come over and help us. And so Paul went to that region of the world, went to the city of Philippi. There was uh, no Jewish synagogue there. And so as he searched, he found a group of people, largely women, who were worshiping on the bank of a river there. And uh, he preached the gospel to them. Some of them believed and, and came to Christ. And there was in particular a Gentile believer who worshiped the, the God of Israel, knew nothing of Christ. Her name was Lydia. And she came to faith. And then the work and the ministry went into her home. And from that came this church in Philippi that Paul is writing to, all right? Unfortunately, persecution flared its ugly head and and you remember the story how Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown into jail. And in spite of all the difficulties being in a jail cell at night, they praised God. They sang praises. God sent an earthquake. The Philippian jailer got saved. Well, this is that very church that Paul is writing to. Uh, you know, the Philippian jailer probably was one of the first to, you know, read this letter and hear about what Paul had to say. So he was close to all of these people. And so this is really a book from a man who cared about the people in Philippi. And Philippians is a very, very personal book, all right? In four chapters, Paul uses the words, I, me, and mine over 100 times. And as you know, this is just a short little book in the Bible. But it, it's, it's, so it's a very personal letter, and it tells us a lot about Paul. And it's also a practical letter because it tells us it deals with a lot of the problems in life that we all face. A lot of examples of day-to-day -day decisions are found here. And uh, most of all, 
the book of Philippians is a positive book. As we look around our country, you know, we all see negative things. There's coronavirus. There's the death of George Floyd. There's rioting in the streets. There's problems seemingly everywhere in our world with unemployment. I thought we needed something very, very positive to look at. Uh, the words joy or rejoice or be glad or be glad are used 17 different times in this book. And so over the next, I'm not sure how many weeks it will be, but uh, we're next few weeks at least, we're going to be talking about the broader subject of how to enjoy the rest of your life, all right? Uh, because this deals with joy in spite of the circumstances. And this is something we've got to learn as Christians, something we've got to learn as believers that's happening even right now. We need to have joy in spite of everything that's going on around us. Uh, it, it seems kind of like 2020 <laughs> has been a very hard year in our society. and We need some encouragement. And I think we're going to get that from the book of Philippians. So in the first chapter, and please follow along with me with your pen and paper in your Bible. And in the first chapter, Paul starts talking off, right off, talking about people, okay? Now here's the key, all right? If relationships are bad, your life stinks, right? <laughs> And, uh, you know, unfortunately, our country is, the relationships in our country are not good. Between the African-American community and the police, there's a lot of strain. There's a lot of strain between people who are white and people who are African-Americans. There's difficulty, and, and that's just caused a lot of difficulty and heartaches. Well, what's true on a national scale would be true in a personal level, in our homes, in our families, in a church. If relationships aren't good in a church, there's lots of difficulty. And so uh, if relationships are strained, life is difficult. And if you have people, uh, problems with people, it kills the joy in life. So tonight we're going to look at how to enjoy the people in your life. And everybody has people in their life. Peter Drucker, who's one of... Uh, great uh, management kind of a individual uh, said that the number one characteristic of any leader is that they enjoy other people. And so we want to be have leaders in our church and in our life that enjoy other people. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you enjoy the people around you? What about the people that you work with? What about the people that you're married to? Okay. What about the people in your family, the people in your church? Uh, the Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 9, 9, husbands enjoy life with your wife whom you love, right? The problem that I find in many marriages is that, you know, it's kind of a more of a matter of endurance than enjoyment, but we should be really able to enjoy life with each other and uh, not just endure life with each other. So let's jump into the scripture, then we're going to jump into an outline, all right? Philippians chapter 1, verse number 3 says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just that as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, In this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So that's a pretty powerful passage of Scripture. We're going to dissect it tonight, looking at how we can enjoy the people in our life. All right, now for Paul, he was writing, and he gives us these kind of under-the-surface principles as he's enjoying the people in his church life, right? But the same principles work for us as we're enjoying the family people, uh, the business people. The principles are true no matter how you apply them. So I'm going to give you today 
four keys. Please write them down tonight. It'll help you to remember these four keys on how to enjoy the people in your life from the book of Philippians, okay? First thing, you've got to be grateful for the good in people. Be grateful for the good in people. Verse 3 says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Uh, Paul said, I like to remember the good things about people. I like to focus on the good experience and the good times we've had. Remember the positive experiences. So the question is, what do you remember about the people in your life? The good experiences or the bad experiences? Uh, when Paul said this, you know, he, he actually had not had an easy time in Philippi, as we talked about a moment ago, right? He was arrested illegally, beaten, thrown in prison, asked to leave town. There was an earthquake. I mean, you know, it was some incredible, incredible days that he had. But Paul, and he, so he really didn't have that great of a time in Philippi. I'm sure it wasn't fun getting beating. He had beaten. He had a bad time. But yet he says, when I think about you guys in Philippi, I remember the good things. I thank God every time I remember you. You know, Paul could have been the type of person that dwelt on the negative. He could have chosen to remember the painful memories, but he chose not to remember the pain, but when he focused instead on the things that he could be grateful for. Are you grateful for the good in people? Uh Maybe tonight we should make a list of the people, and you should make a list of the people in your life and ask yourself, am I enjoying them? What about your kids, your parents, your cousins, your aunts and uncles, the people you work with? Uh, what are you remembering about them? And sometimes you have to forget things, right? Now, I love Maureen Doug, uh, not Douglas anymore, Maureen Rousey, and I hope that she's watching She's a long-term loving member of our congregation. And one time I asked her, I said, Maureen, I have a question for you. I said, has anybody ever said anything to you that hurt you and offended you? She didn't want to answer right away, but, but in just a moment or two, she said, yes, Pastor Bob, they did. And I said, well, what did you do about that? She said, well, a couple days later, I just decided to forget that. Now, that's some really good advice from the gospel of marine okay uh and so and i have no idea who hurt marine i wouldn't ask her wouldn't pry into that she's not that type of person she'd even tell you but uh, i hope and i believe that she's probably enjoying some of those people today in her life because she was able to push the hurt away and be able to enjoy the good and so maybe you have in your past been hurt by a, a parent or maybe a sibling or a church member, and you're still holding on to that hurt. You know, as a result, you're not enjoying them today. You're still focusing on the bad and the negative. Listen, be grateful for the good in people. Pleasant memories are kind of a choice, right? I can choose what I'm going to think about and remember about the past. And so here's the lesson in this, and you may want to jot this little lesson down, right? Remember the best, forget the rest. Right, And I'm not saying here that you deny your hurts that you've had or that you excuse the weaknesses in other people. That's not very psychologically healthy for a person, right? But focus on the good and choose to emphasize the strength. You know, I've had wives say something to me like this. They've said, you know, he's a good man, but... Oh, man, anytime you hear the word but there, you can know that the emphasis is really going to be on the negative and not on the positive. And men have probably said the very same thing. You know, he, she's, a, he's, he, she's a good wife, but, you know. Uh, listen, Mr. and Mrs. Perfect don't exist anywhere out there. So just be grateful for the good in other people. And, of course, you know, Paul appreciated people's loyalty. Verse 5 of this chapter that we're in, Philippians chapter 1, in case you're just joining us, uh, the New King James Version, Paul says, he's thankful for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, this was, this was Paul's church family, not his physical family, all right? But it was his family as far as the kingdom was concerned. But, but uh, he was talking to the people he was closest to. The good news version of this verse kind of makes it more relatable it says this, you have helped me from the very first day until now. Wow, 
Who's been loyal to you? All right? Maybe someone at work or a friend or a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad. Maybe they didn't do anything really spectacular. But time and time again, when they had every opportunity to walk out on you, they did it. They hung in there. They went through the bankruptcy with you, the crisis at work, the change in careers, right? Uh, maybe even when you were just being a jerk, okay? I'm not talking to anybody good specifically here today, but they stayed with you. And you ought to really appreciate that. Uh, they haven't left, and they've had plenty of good reasons, right? So if you want to enjoy others, you've got to focus on their strengths and not their weaknesses. And with some people, it might take a little creativity, but you can find something good in everybody, in everybody, uh, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's a beautiful thing. And then secondly, not only just focus on the good, find the good, but also practice positive praying, if you want to enjoy the people in your life, you got to pray for them. And uh, that's what Paul says in verse number four, Philippians 1, verse 4, the New King James Version. He says, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. Paul literally prayed for the people that were in his life. Now, these were church friends and family and people he worked with. He, didn't, he was never married, okay? But Paul was, and we can pray for the people that we know and love, the people that are in our life. And uh, so, I mean, man, how would you like to have Paul the Apostle praying for you? That'd be amazing. Well, I got to tell you something. You got somebody better than the Apostle Paul praying for you. Jesus right now is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, okay? So, Anyway, but that that encourages us, right? And, and isn't it an encouragement when you know that people are praying for you by remembering you uh, before the Lord and, and praying for you? And so here, here's, here's the lesson in all of this. The quickest way to change a relationship from bad to good is to start thanking God in prayer for people. Start thanking God in prayer for people. Maybe you're having a difficult relationship with a person. Start thanking God. Find something you can thank God for them about and thank God in prayer. Let me tell you what it's going to do. It's going to do two things. First of all, it's going to change your attitude, right? You might be thinking, well, man, my attitude don't need to be changed. I know that Bob's attitude is needed to be changed on many occasions. All right. So anyway, and then it'll also change them. Positive praying is much more powerful than positive thinking or even positive advice, right? People can resist our advice. They can spurn our appeals. They can reject our suggestions. They may not listen to our help, right? But when you pray for them, they've got a the Holy Spirit's working. Come on. They can't resist that. And when you say to somebody, I'll pray for you, you know, that's important. And so and so the question becomes, well, what do we pray for them? And most of us, we're pretty good at praying if somebody has a crisis. But on a, on a normal basis, what do you pray? You just pray, oh, God, just bless them. You know, that's way too general of a prayer. You'll never even know whether uh, God's even answering your prayer if that's all you pray. The more specific you are in prayer, the more specific you're going to get an answer. And Paul here in this little passage in Philippians 1, he spells out very specifically what it is that he's praying for the people in his life. And I have found this, that when I pray the word of God, when I take God's word and I literally pray it back to the Lord, the promises that are found in those verses, man, God answers those kind of prayers. You can pray the word of God over your family and, and that'll help you to enjoy the people in your life. And there are numerous prayers that Paul wrote down and they can serve as a guide. And there's one of them that's found here in this very passage, verses nine through 11. Let me reread that prayer for you tonight. Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you might be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Listen, you can pray that prayer over your kids, your mom, your grandmother, your teacher, your boss, whoever it is in your life. And so there's four things here in this little prayer 
that Paul wrote down in Philippians that we can pray over people. And they're going to be answered because they're in the Bible and they're God's will, all right? First of all, you can pray that their love will that they will grow in their in love. That's what Paul says, that your love may abound more and more. That means that he wants that love to be like a tidal wave in their life. It's when people have love for each other that good things happen. I don't know if you've seen it on the news, but I've been watching the news about all these crises in America. Every once in a while, they show some beautiful picture of love. Somebody who just embraces somebody. Somebody who crosses that line of distinction and, and loves the person in front of them. And it is absolutely beautiful. And you can be assured that the key to your family being happy is love. And so when we pray, God, let them have more love in their life, that's a good thing, right? Because uh, in homes, parents need to love their kids. Kids need to love their parents. In marriages, spouses need to love one another. In a workplace, now, uh, there there shouldn't be romantic love. Sometimes there is. Uh, but, uh, you know, there ought to at least be a, a loving type of respect for one another. Employees ought to care about their bosses, and their bosses ought to really care about their employees, right? So we can pray this, that love would abound, that they, people would grow in love, and that would be a good thing. And then we need to pray, secondly, that they make wise decisions. Pray for your family, the people in your life, that they would make wise decisions. Now, that's what Paul says here. He said, more in knowledge and depth of insight. Now, notice what he says, so that you might be able to discern what is best. Man, that's easy to pray. Uh, you know, bad decisions destroy lives. Bad decisions destroy homes, uproot families, cause great separation and division and heartaches. And, and, and uh, we need to pray that people make the right choices in life. And uh, even things like praying for someone to make the right choice about a job or a promotion or a move or, you know, pr pray that people make the right choices in their lives. And, and, and listen, God will answer that prayer. And then thirdly, we need to pray that they will do the right thing. Right? We need to pray that people will actually do the right thing. Uh, Paul says here, he says that you might be pure and blameless and have a clear conscience. You know, right? Right living produces happy relationships. Uh, wherever there's wrong living, relationships are destroyed. Wherever people live selfishly, wherever people think only uh, of, of their wants, desires, and needs, it obviously it destroys family. It destroys the good feeling that's with, within a family. But And anyone will tell you that sin and the devil will kill, steal, and, to, and, and destroy. So we want to pray that people will do the right thing, be pure and blameless. Now, that doesn't mean that people are going to be absolutely perfect after you pray this. No, sir. People are human. But that they'll make the right decision, you know. People can 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 live a a life that's that's honoring of God, and that's what it's talking about. Pray this over your family and the people in your life, and then pray that they will live for God's glory, you know, that 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 their life will exemplify what God wants in their life. It says here for, that you might be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Pray for your family that they'll have that fruit of righteousness. Uh, Righteousness means right standing with God and right living in the world, okay? That the fruit of the Holy Spirit would be part of their life. And and I tell you, there are no more happier families and relationships and people than people who have dedicated their lives to serve the Lord together. Uh, you know, people that are together in groups and together in their in their desire to to, to help others, man, that 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 brings them close because they're bringing glory to God. And I, I believe that the greatest marriages in the world they're not found in Hollywood. No, it's not, you know, on some reality show somewhere. No, it's found in the kingdom of God where people are serving God and their lives are filled with the fruit of righteousness. And it's just like an overflow goes into their home and into their family and into their lives with their children and grandchildren and all of that. And so listen, pray this over your family. And then, uh, so now you need to pray uh, for the, be, practice, practice positive praying and uh, be grateful for the, the good in people's lives 
But the third thing we need to do, if we're going to enjoy our family, the third thing is we've got to be willing to be very patient with their progress. You know, Paul looked at people's futures and not just at their past. He looked at their potential and was patient with their progress. And he gives one of the most encouraging verses. It's found right here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. This is what Paul says of the people he was enjoying in his life. He said, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says this. Paul says, what God starts, God finishes, right? And he was confident that God was going to complete the work he had begun in people. In other words, he was saying, look, I'm going to be, I'm patient with you, Philippians. Okay? Now, mankind, we, we start a lot of things but don't finish them, right? I hope you don't have any projects around the house that need finishing. I've got a few. All right. Uh, man leaves unfinished symphonies, unfinished buildings, unfinished books that, that they were going to write, you know, unfinished projects. Man doesn't always finish what he starts, but God always finishes the things that he starts. He doesn't make a bird and just give him half a wing, right? Uh-uh. He doesn't make an unfinished flower or an unfinished star. No. He puts the finishing touches on everything, and then he says, what I've created, man, it is good. And the Bible says this, that when Jesus Christ starts working in your life and in my life, he's going to complete what he started. It's a good promise. It's true of you, and it's true for your the people in your life. And so that means that in spite of your hang-ups, their hang-ups, the bad decisions, sins, in spite of all the circumstances of life, God's going to finish what he started. And uh, we're going to make it. Your family members are going to make it. Your, 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 your life is going to you know, continue to grow and change. And the Bible says that when you get to heaven one day, you're going to become just like Jesus because you will see him as he is. That's going to be glorious. That's the goal. God starts what he finishes, all right? And uh, th there's a lesson in this for us as we, as we attempt to enjoy the people in our life. And the lesson is this. God isn't finished with people. He's not done with them. He's not done working on you either, by the way. He's not done working on Bob. I'm a big 6-0, and he's still working on me to try to knock off the rough edges and make me more like Jesus, all right? Now, back when I was a teen, we had these little pins that we wore. I don't know whether it was an evangelist that came or some program or something, but they had a whole bunch of letters on them. These were the letters that said P-B-P-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. It was the first letters of please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. And so when people would say, what does the pen mean? We would tell them, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Kind of as a witnessing tool, I guess. And uh, But, you know, we need to be patient with people's progress. You know, if there's anything that working, you know, Celebrate Recovery has taught me as I listen to many, many multiple testimonies is that, you know, people need time to change, time to grow, time to process, time to work on their lives. And God gives people that time. Aren't you glad? He's given us that time. And we need to be patient as God gives other people that time. I know I can say, you know, I'm not the man I used to be. Thank God. But also, thank God, I'm not the man I'm going to be. I'm growing and changing. In your marriage, if you want to enjoy your marriage, you've got to learn how to enjoy your husband or your wife right now while allowing for growth and development in them. You know, the same is true with your adult children. You know, you say, well, I don't really like how they live, who they have become. Listen, let God deal with them. Learn how to enjoy them. Be patient with them as they're growing in their life as well. Otherwise, by the time they meet all of your conditions, 
guess what's going to happen? You'll probably still have another condition that, hey, okay, well, you met these five. Now you need to do this, this, and this. Listen, allow people to be who they are. Let them be patient with them. They're growing in life too. And uh, you've got to in learn how to enjoy them where they are right now. Parents, you've got to learn how to enjoy your kids where they are in life right now. They're in a process. They're still growing. And guess what? There's no such thing as a perfect kid. And there's no such thing as a perfect adult either. So if you are the type of person who demands perfection of everybody around you and in your life, man, you're not going to you're not going to enjoy them very much. You know, you've got to be confident that they're going to change. Be confident and trust in God and your prayers for them, that God is working in their life. Uh, nobody's perfect, right? If you demand perfection from the people in your life, you're probably going to be miserable your whole life because there's nobody that's perfect. All right, so I'm just trying to teach this tonight. But now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you've got to you know, stay with a person that, you know, beats you senseless on occasion. Ah, no, 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 no. Get as far away from that person as possible or a repeat adulterer. This is not what the scripture's, you know, talking about here. Uh, you know, uh, but, but the truth is that there's a lot of people who destroy relationships over things that are really small. Like, well, you know, they're a little cranky at times. They say, you know, something a little stern sometimes. Well, I'm not saying don't confront them, you know, do that. But what I'm saying is give people space to grow in life, and, and you'll discover that they actually will. Uh, Paul, I just got something just popped into my mind, you know. My wife is always encouraging me to put things back in the refrigerator in the right spot. You know, I've got this terrible habit, you know, I get the barbecue sauce out, put it on my chicken, I just put it right up there on the front shelf by the milk. It's supposed to go over there in the door, you know, but my wife's very patient with me. I'm glad I need that. Anyway, Paul says that he enjoyed the Philippians because he chose to ignore the bad things that happened and concentrated on the good. He was grateful for the good things that happened. He practice positive praying, and he prayed with joy for specific things in their life. And uh, if you want to change your attitude, here's what you need to do. Start praying for that person who irritates you. Now, there might be somebody at work, uh, in your home, a child, a mate, but just pray for them and just see what happens to your attitude. God will give you patience with them. It's a great verse in the book of John. John 1, 12 says, To them he gave the power to become, key word there, to become the sons of God. You know, we are becomers. It's amazing that we're instantaneously, we can become his child of God the moment we put our faith in him. But there's something called progressive sanctification that people are growing into becoming like Christ. And to enjoy people, you've got to be able to enjoy them in the process, not when they've arrived. And so the scripture says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on until completion, until the day of Jesus. We have to be confident. We have to believe that God is able to change the human personality. Uh, Paul believed that nobody was hopeless. He never gave up on people. He never scratched them out of the book. And this is a great promise of God. We need to claim it for our kids, uh, for your mate, and even for yourself. And what Paul's really talking about here is faith, right? Faith is expecting the best from other people. And there's tremendous, tremendous power in faith. Do you realize that we're often shaped by uh, our other people's expectations in our life? And we, we tend to live up to the expectations that people have of us. And other people tend to live up to what we think we, they uh, think we expect of them. But uh, it is also a very common mistake that we tend to judge people on the basis of how far they have to go rather than how far they have come. And so let's learn to be patient with one another. And I think that we'll enjoy the people in our life more and more. And then the last thing that Paul talks about here is that we've got to love people from the heart. 
Verse 7 says, because I have you in my heart. Wow, what beautiful words. Paul's writing to these people that he's loved, the Philippian jailer, Lydia, all those people who had ministered to him and helped him and encouraged him along life's way. And he says, guess what? You're not just in my mind up here. No, no, no. You're down in my heart, man. The, the, the that, that relationship was real and it was full of love. And what I've discovered is that if I don't have people in my heart, they get on my nerves. Okay? If you don't have your kids in your heart, they're going to get on your nerves. <laughs> if you don't have your husband or wife in your heart, they get on your nerves. And, and the reason why so many marriages are crumbling is that mates are reacting to each other from their minds and not from their hearts. So when your wife says, I, I feel depressed, it's time for you to listen to her. That, that's a legitimate thing that she has going on there. When your husband says, you know, I don't really feel like we ought to do uh, this. It's not the right thing for us. We ought to do it this other way. Listen to him. And listening and loving from the heart does something. What it does is it, he, it hears the hurt that's behind the words. Heart love really begins with understanding the person that's in front of you, knowing why they feel that way, knowing why they do the things that they do. And you might be thinking about someone in your in your job or whatever, and you might be thinking, you know, why does that guy at work act like such a big jerk? I mean, man. You know, maybe you don't really know the background of, of you know, of what he had to grow up in. Maybe you don't know what he's been through. Maybe he's actually tons better than he used to be, and he's working on these things. So what I'm saying is hear the hurt, look for the problems, and know what makes people tick and understand them. And you can't love someone that you don't understand. And actually, I've discovered that understanding people makes it easier to love them. Uh, you need to understand the moods of the people that are closest around you, the pressures that they're under, why they act kind of the way that they do. And if you care, in other words, here's a little statement. If you care, you're going to be aware. You know, be self-aware of yourself and be aware of the feelings and what's going on with the people around you. And heart love begins with understanding. And so the question, because if if, if, if I need understanding, where do I get understanding? And you get understanding by asking questions and then listening. Now, I should actually invite my wife, Jereen, to come and teach this part because she is the queen of this. She is amazing at this. She has this down. She's an expert at asking questions and listening to people, giving them feedback and talking to them and and, uh, and, and she has that, you know why? She has that heart love inside of her. And, uh, you know, and what a comfort it is to know that, that people fully understand you. And so the question becomes, well, I understand this person, man, Pastor Bob, but, oh, man, I'm still having a hard time loving them, okay? Paul had a question. Paul had an answer for that question, Okay. Uh, verse number eight here in Philippians one is a powerful verse. It says, New King James Version says, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you. Notice what it says, with all the affection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that word affection is a powerful word. It's actually in the Greek, it's the word for believe it or not, intestine, intestines, you know. Uh, the King James, that's why the King James Version translate this bowels. But, you know, in Greek society, they thought that the seat of the, the emotions was, you know, in, in your stomach, in your liver, in your internal organs. And uh, uh, Paul would say something like this, I have a gut love uh, feeling of, a gut feeling of love for you. And it is that intensive love that allows us to love even the unlovely. And I'll tell you, it's not really a natural kind of love. I believe that it's a supernatural kind of love. And that's why Paul says it's not from himself, but it's from the affection that comes from Jesus Christ, the affection of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Human love 
tends to wear out. It tends to dry up on the vine. It happens to everybody, you know, that the feelings of love in particular, they tend to dry up. But the, the only kind of love that really lasts, and it lasts in spite of a heartache, in spite of difficulty, in very tough circumstances, the kind of love that we really need as believers to love the people around us no matter who they are, even that guy at work that drives us crazy, okay, or that woman at work that drives us crazy, okay, it, it, we need the affection of Jesus Christ. That's the only kind of love that lasts. And there's a beautiful scripture in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 5. Uh, let me read it to you from the New King James Version. It says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God, now notice the imagery here, has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that was given to us. Let me tell you, God's love is not something that you have to work up to. Oh, grit your teeth. I'm going to love with God's love. No, that's not what it's all about. It's something that God pours into us by his Holy Spirit as I allow the Holy Spirit to live through me day by day. And uh, you say, well, how do, how do I get that God to pour that love in me? There's only one way that I know of, and that's that you spend time with God in his presence. That's you in worship. You open up your heart, your life, and you love on Jesus. And let me tell you, when you do that, God just pours his love into your heart. It's a supernatural kind of love that allows you to love from down here in the deepest part of your life and love that person. And that allows you to pray and allows you to enjoy the people in your life. And, and so if you don't learn to enjoy the people in your life that God has given you, you're going to be miserable. And so as Paul begins this great book about joy, we're going to continue to study this book day by week by week. We're going to really dig into this book and find out what it says. And we're not just going to study the historical stuff of it. We're going to study that, but we're going to figure out how does this book really apply to my life? How does chapter one apply to my life? By enjoying the people God gave you in your life. And it's a book about joy. And so uh, we've got to learn how to love like Jesus did. And so, you know, uh, who do you need to be thankful for tonight? Who have you taken for granted in your life? Who have you failed to appreciate? When's the last time you wrote maybe a thank you note or bought some flowers or texted someone a kind word? How, how many times has someone done that for you and you just kind of took it for granted? Uh, are you praying for people around you every day? Praying for your children, for your mom, for your wife, for your dad? Uh, do you pray that they'll be filled with love and make wise decisions? And, uh, uh, you know, who do you need to be patient with in their progress? Maybe somebody at work, maybe your kids, maybe your husband or wife in their progress. Or who do you need to start loving from the heart and not from the head? And uh, so Paul had started this church. He was the founding pastor, but he had those people in his heart, and he loved them from the heart. He learned how to enjoy them. Listen, let me pray with you today, Ed, that God would just fill you full of his love today. Thank you for enjoying this Bible study time. You know, the beautiful thing is that you can go back and re-watch this if you need to. It's going to stay right there on Facebook. In fact, I'm going to actually upload this onto YouTube, so you're going to be there for a long time, easy to find. And uh, anyway, we want you to enjoy the people in your life, especially during these difficult seasons. We need each other. We're in this together. At together, we're in this, right? So uh, anyway, we, we need each other. So let me pray. Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters tonight who are watching this Bible teaching that we're giving. And Lord, I pray, Lord, for them that you would just right now, God, as a result of studying the book of Philippians, that you would fill them with love, that you would just fill their hearts with such a joy and a peace and a love, Lord, that they would begin to, and it would just overflow in them and it would spread out into every relationship that they have. God, if those relationships are a one or two, God, on a scale of 10, God, I pray that you'd just bring them up to a five or a six or a seven. If they're an eight, I pray you'd bring it to a 10, Lord. I pray that everybody's relationships would grow as a result of not only hearing this word, but actually doing the word and applying it into our life. And God, I pray that there would be a resurgence of people praying for one another, caring about one another, praying the word of God. 
over their families. And Lord, I pray, God, for people specifically who need physical touches in their life. Today, I pray for Bonnie Rodriguez, Lord. She's suffering, God, and she needs a healing touch. God, in the name of Jesus, we pray healing in her body. In Jesus' name, we love you, Bonnie. We're praying for you if you happen to be watching this tonight. But anyway, we love you guys. We thank you for this. Listen, we want you to, to, to join us once again uh, this coming Sunday at 10 uh, uh, 30 on Facebook Live. And uh, uh, Or if you can, you can come to church. Listen, we've got the church. We keep the doors open open you know you don't have to there's sanitizer everywhere there's disinfectant wipes um people wear masks when they're you know close to one another in honor of one another and uh listen we just want to encourage you if you possibly can we've, we've moved a lot of chairs people just come and sit space one another out and uh, we've been having a great time of worship. The tears were flowing this Sunday in worship as people gathered. So come and, and uh, be a part of that if you can. If you can, and by the way, we don't pressure anybody into coming. No, you come back when you feel it's safe. That's this pastor's heart love for you, okay? But listen, we want to encourage you to make sure you connect with us on Facebook Live. Worship with us. Pray with us. Believe God with us. Hear the word together. And uh, we'll... Be sure to see you very, very soon. God bless you. We love each and every one of you. Thank you for watching tonight.